So Surah at takwir is a Makki Surah. It was revealed early on in the Meccan period, meaning before the migration of the Prophet وسلم, to Medina. And the names of the Surah, again, a lot of the Surahs have titles, various titles. Uh, this one doesn't have any specific title that was given by the Prophet وسلم, <coughs> but it was referred to by the first verse uh, as he referred to most of the Surahs by their first verses. So in the Shamsu Kubirat, which is the first ayah or the first line of the, uh, of the Surah, this was kind of used to uh, refer to it as well. Uh, another name is at takwir which is the common name for the Surah. And at takwir sorry, let me just get this back up. Al-Taqwir means the folding up, or something being wrapped around or folded up. And it's called also referred to as Surat Kuwilat, uh, because that's the word that's used in the, uh, the first ayah, the Shamsu Kuwilat itself. But basically, Al-Taqwir is the main name of the Surah, which again means the folding up, referring to the folding or wrapping up of the, of the sun. According to the order of revelation, it's said to be the seventh Surah in the order of revelation. So we know it's a very, very early Surah that was revealed. And the theme of uh, this surah, it covers two out of the three themes of the, of the Qur'an itself. Again, the three themes are the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the hereafter, and the apostleship, or the, the, the messengership or prophethood of the Prophet. So this theme, or this surah covers the hereafter. Literally, the first half of the surah talks about the hereafter. The second half talks about the, uh, the truth of the prophethood of the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. And this concludes uh, the, the, the whole themes of the surah. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu he said مَنْ صَرَّهُ وَنَنْذُرَ إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ كَأَنَّهُ رَأْيُ عِينَ فَلْيَقْرَ إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُوِرَتْ وَإِذَا السَّمَاءُ فَضَّرَتْ وَإِذَا السَّمَاءُ شَقَّتْ He said, whoever would like to take a look at the day of resurrection, as if he was to see it with his own eyes, then let him read these three chapters of the Qur'an, and he mentioned this one first, إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُوِرَتْ meaning Surah Takbir, the one after this, Surah number 82, and uh, the one uh, 80, uh, Four, Surah number 84, which is Al-Inshitaq, in the way the Sabah Mushaqtaq. In the beginning of all three of these surahs, Allah Azza wa is describing how this world is going to come to an end. What are the signs, the major signs that are going to take place that we're going to be seeing the, the end of this world and then the beginning of uh, the next, inshallah. So this is going to be, uh, sorry, these are the three surahs that he said, if you want to be able to see what it will look like, then read these three surahs and you'll get an idea of what that's like. In this Surah, we're going to take a look at the first 14 ayat, and this is the first theme of the surah, the hereafter, and it contains 12 events that will take place. It talks about 12 signs or 12 events that will happen. Six that will happen before the day of resurrection, meaning at the very end, the last moment or the last portion of time on this earth or in this world. And the next six that it mentions are the six that will take place after people are resurrected. So again, these people are denying the concept of there being an akhirah or a hereafter. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving them now signs, which are again for us to be able to see as well. Six before and six after. So six towards the end of time and six uh, that will take place after people are resurrected uh, as well. So the surah starts, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytwan ar-rajim, bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ida shamsu kubirat wa idha nujumun kadarat wa idha jibalu suyirat. The first three ayat of the surah. The translation of which, uh, when the sun is wrapped up in darkness, and when the stars fall dispersing, and when the mountains are removed. Now, the word kubirat, which is used for the sun, in the shamsu kubirat, when the sun is kubirat, it literally means uh, to wrap something around itself. So the, the explanation of this word has been said to mean when the sun is darkened, meaning when it, something will wrap around it, it will take away the light that is uh, around it, it's, it will be darkened, uh, it will fade away. Right? Some of the, the scholars of Tafsir said what the word Kuwirat here means is the sun itself will fade away, it will sink inward to become hollow, or it will be wrapped up, and again, like a turban is wrapped around someone's head, something will be wrapped up, or they said it will wrap up around itself, and the light will extinguish. Right? The light of it will, it will extinguish, and some of them even mentioned that it will return to whatever it was ori originally created from, or the core or the source of whatever it is. But this is a major sign, <coughs> excuse me, a major sign from amongst the signs of the the, the destruction of, of this, this existence. That the sun itself, which we depend upon uh, for our livelihood, for our lives, for the things that matter to us in this world, again, you know, the plants grow because of the sun and so on and so forth, even energy we now we get from the sun, uh, it's going to be depleted, it's going to turn, it's going to basically just go away. And when the stars in Kedah, like when the stars, they basically fall down from their positions. So whatever order or whatever force is 
is keeping these things wherever they are, right? Whatever uh, command of Allah is keeping these things in their places, in their orbits, however they're functioning, that will cease to exist, that will be disrupted, and the stars will actually, in Kedarat means to like fall, and basically pile up, collide with each other, right? I mean, it'll just be, uh, there's so much order that we see right now, you know, usually, the, what we see the majority of things don't run into each other, except that Allah wills, but it will just turn into utter chaos, right? Things will start, you know, colliding, falling, and all this kind of stuff. And when the mountains will be removed, right? The mountains themselves will be removed. Uh, there are places in the Quran where Allah describes this phenomenon in different words. So here he's described them as being removed, meaning taking out of their original places, uprooted basically. In another ayah of the Quran, Allah says, فَكَانَتْ هَبَاءً مُبَثَّةً The mountains will turn like dust scattered about, meaning they will be lifted from their places and just they will be made to. Uh, I mean, if you think about a mountain, it's a huge thing. It's a huge thing. It's a very powerful thing. But it will be turned into just dust that will be scattered around. In Surah al Naba, we did this ayah before. Same word, Suyilat. And the mountains will be uh, like a mirage. They will be removed and they will be like a mirage. A mirage is something that you think is there, but it's not. So you're looking at the mountain, and this is, describes the, the quickness of, by which it will be removed from its place and turned into dust. You'll think it's still there because you might still see the outline of it or whatever. But it will just be utter destruction, it will be chaos, I mean, again the sun will be wrapped up, the stars will be falling down, so even the mountains on the earth will be uh, you know, taken apart. And what seems to be happening is that whatever force is there that is keeping these things in their places will be disrupted and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do whatever He wills. Then He says, وَإِذَا الْعِشَارُ وَرُطِّلَتْ وَإِذَا الْوَحُوشُ حُشِرَتْ وَإِذَا الْبِحَارُ سُجِّرَتْ and when the full-term she-camels are neglected, and these are uh, an isha are the pregnant she-camels. When the full-term pregnant she-camels are neglected, and we'll explain this, and when the wild beasts are gathered, and when the seas are filled with flame. So now he's continuing to describe these things, and these are the final three things of the six that will happen before the day of resurrection, meaning the last moments on this in this existence. When the isha when the isha are neglected, the isha is a camel that's been pregnant now for about ten months. And it's almost reached its, its you know, uh, perfect prime time to deliver uh, the child. And this camel is worth a lot. So again, the, 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 the point is not about the camel. The point is about the worth of what this, these people have in this camel, right? So these are the camels that were given a lot of care because this camel is producing another camel. And we know that those camels were a source of great wealth, right? A source of sustenance for the Arabs at the time. And what's being said is that when the most prized possession of the people will be neglected. Meaning things that people would never leave for anything. In this time, because of the chaos that will be existing, they will forget even their most prized possessions. The things that they value the most, the things that you know, will give them uh, the most out of whatever they try to get in this world. So it's the most prized possession of the Arabs and due to the chaos that will exist in the final album, they will leave these prized possessions. And again, they're being told in a language that they'll understand. So this this Isha uh, is something that is 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 very, very valuable. It's a, it's a camel giving birth to a camel. You have two camels now. So this is, this is worth a lot of money for them at the time. And when the wild land animals are gathered. This is an interesting ayah in the Quran again. Uh, some of the Mufassirin, they say that they will gather in one place and they will die. Other Mufassirin, they say that they will be gathering because there will be no other place for them to go because the waters will be rising. And this is the next ayah of the, of, of the surah as well. Which here has been translated as when the, uh, the the seas or the oceans catch on fire, but there's another uh, tafsir of that as well. So the the other understanding is that the animals will be migrating, gathering together, running away from one common uh, you know source of chaos, and that will mean that the waters will be rising up above their limits and overflowing and taking over everything. And they say that this is also a phenomenon because animals that tend to run away from each other, right? Like a lion, uh, if you, if you know if a deer is around a lion, it will run away. But at this time, you will see animals that tend to run away from each other, basically migrating, moving together, because there's one common chaos. All of their lives are at risk. And that's because, وَإِذَنْ بِحَارُ سُجِّرَتْ The next ayah, and when the oceans are sujirat, and sujirat, it can mean two things. Number one, set on fire, meaning they're made to catch fire. And number two, it can mean to overflow, to go over their established boundaries. So the oceans will be basically climbing, rising, and the water will be overflowing to the point where the animals won't have any places to go except wherever they're migrating together. The other meaning is also that they will catch fire. And this is also an acceptable meaning, and it's also a very, very possible thing. Again, uh, uh, there actually has been, it's interesting, this is a kind of a side note, but there have been people that have been using uh, water 
to make uh, some type of fire. So there's a man somewhere who actually invented a way to uh, use a blowtorch, which is fueled by water, right? It does something with the, the water and it makes a torch. This, this was all in use. Uh, and, but we know that fire is made, uh, sorry, the water is made of, of hydrogen and oxygen, and these are the two components that fire needs to exist as well. Allah is the one who knows best. But it will happen, right? Other scholars have said, well, now we know that there's like oil under the water or whatever, so maybe that will catch fire. Whatever the explanations are, but basically this is the seed of chaos that will exist. Things that are orderly, things that are uh, the way we, we think them to be, will completely change. Excuse me. And the final point that I have here, I'll save until I get to the... Uh, to the end of the other, the next six. But these are the first six uh, ayat that are mentioned. Yeah, I was thinking of like global warming and like the rise of oceans. Yeah, the yeah, lucky must say. <laughs> but when, these are all six signs. So these are things that will happen either in succession or at some point in time. And there will be very, very clear signs of, of, of the chapter. There's still lots to, to do, alhamdulillah. There's still other signs that haven't happened. There are many signs of, of the end of times, the qiyamah that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned. These are just major signs that Allah is mentioning in the Quran. So these are the first things he's, uh, six he's mentioned. The sun folding up, the stars falling down, collapsing on each other, the mountains being destroyed or removed, people abandoning their most prized possessions uh, because of the chaos that will happen, the gathering of the animals and the oceans overflowing or bursting ablaze. And then we go to the next uh, six things, and these are the six things that will happen after people are resurrected. So when these other things are happening, everything will be destroyed. <clears throat> and when these six things happen, people will be recognizing that they are now resurrected and standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for the next portion of their life. So Allah Azza wa Jalla says, وَإِذَا النُّفُوسُ زُوِّجَتْ وَإِذَا الْمَوْؤُدَةُ سُئِلَتْ وَبِأَيِّ رَبٍ قُتِلَتْ <coughs> These are two out of, the, out of the six signs right here. And when the souls are paired up, and when the girl who was buried alive is asked for what sin was she killed. These are the first two things he mentioned, because the first thing that will happen after people are resurrected, because they will be no longer in the form of bodies, is that the souls that exist will be paired up with the bodies again. So Allah Azza wa Jalla will create us Recreate us again as we were, and our souls will be put into another body like the bodies we have, or however Allah Azza wa Jal <coughs> wills that to happen. Another meaning of the verse that the souls will be paired up is that people will be paired up or according to the groups that they belong to. So the people of paradise, the people of hellfire, the people that were righteous, the people that were sinful, there will be people that are divided up. And this is mentioned in places in the Quran where Allah Azza wa Jal mentions, uh, Right? The people on the right and the people on the left and those that are, you know, the very, very forefront and the, the people that are striving to do their best. Uh, so people will be paired up into uh, different groups as well. And then, So after people have been paired up, obviously the next thing that's going to happen is the reckoning. The people being taken to account for what they did in this world. And this is part of what we know will happen uh, in the Day of Resurrection. And the first thing it seems that will be taken care of in terms of reckoning is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, and that is the questioning of the girls that were buried alive at the time of, uh, of the Arabs, in the days of ignorance, what they were called, because this was something that had become socially acceptable for them to do. When they had a girl, they would prefer for her rather to be buried alive rather than to live because she was considered a burden. She had to be, you know, uh, money had to be spent on her to raise her and all this kind of stuff, whereas they saw that boys would become and you know make the, the tribe stronger and make society stronger. So not every single tribe did this, by the way. So Quraysh, the tribe of the Prophet uh, is not known to have been engaged in burying their daughters alive, but there were tribes in that society that did that, and because the other tribes stayed silent, Allah is also is he's mentioning this in the Quran. And he doesn't talk about how uh, bad of a thing it is, because even they realized this is something wrong, this is something bad. Uh, for some reason, they thought it necessary to do so, and for some reason, their society became so, I guess, so lowly that they accepted this. Nobody really spoke out against this, except for a few people, one of which we will see uh, in this as well. So when the Prophet ﷺ came early on in the Meccan period, this is very, very early in the, in the, in the prophethood of the Prophet ﷺ, we know that he was concerned with telling people to worship only one God. But along with that, he also tackled some serious, serious social ills, and this was one of them the burying alive of the, of the girls. So again, uh, the purpose here is the, of asking her, why were you killed? Instead of asking the person that killed her, why did you kill her? What's the significance of that? Why is Allah going to ask the girl herself, why, for what sin were you killed? What did you do that this person killed you? It's basically to rebuke the one that killed her. To rebuke the one that killed her, that will be made to listen to this question by Allah not even asking him 
He's not even being asked why he killed her. She's being asked why she was killed. And the way the, the verse is structured obviously means that she had no sin. This was a little girl, this was a newborn baby or a young child. There was no sin. And the person being made to listen to this is being made to realize how uh, you know, depraved of an act this was, how horrible of a thing this was. And he's not even being addressed himself. The victim is being addressed and used as, a, as being made a witness to what took place. Another recitation of this verse, it says, وَإِذَا الْمَعُودَةُ سَأَلَتْ بِأَيِّ ذَنْبٍ قُتِلْتُ that uh, when the girl buried alive will ask herself, for which sin was I killed? So this also shows you another scene, that she will also be asking the person that uh, took her life, what is it that I did that you killed me for? And again, it is that, uh, it is reasonless, it's baseless for what they did. And in another recitation of the verse, it says, قُتِلَتْ with, uh, with an emphasis on the, on the word, on the final word, which is the, the, the word of for killing. For which reason was she slaughtered? Meaning it just, it just, it uses the word, a brutal form of, of killing. And it's narrated that what uh, would happen is usually when uh, some of these tribes that practice this, when they were giving birth, they would dig a grave. And the woman giving birth would give birth next to the grave. And if she gave birth to a, a female child, they would immediately bury the child. And if it was a male, then obviously they would, they would keep the child. So this is the level that, uh, which they had gone to. And there were people, there were people in the pre-Islamic times in the days of ignorance that spoke out against this and were activists against this. And one of them is uh, Sa'sa ibn Najiyah. And he became a Muslim. He later became a Muslim. And this is a narration that we have from him when he was uh, explained, asking the Prophet Sallallahu a question. So Sa'sa ibn Najiyah had accepted Islam and was learning Quran from the Prophet Sallallahu when he asked him, will I be rewarded from the good deeds I did before I accepted Islam? So the Prophet Sallallahu asked him, to describe his deeds. And he mentioned that once he had lost two pregnant she camels. So the word Isha is also used in this. He had lost two pregnant she camels. These are very, very valuable things. And he went looking for them. And he found a couple of houses and an old man who had found his she camels. So while he was there sitting with him, a woman cried out from a nearby house, she has given birth. Meaning the, the man's uh, whoever, wife or child, whatever had given birth. And what has she given, the, the man, old man said, and what has she given birth to? If it is a boy, then he will accompany our people. If it is a girl, we will bury her. So Sa'asa Sa said, I will buy her from you. He immediately told him, I will buy her from you. And he said, do you not, do you not, do you know that we are a people from Buddha? 